I um, want to begin by expressing my gratitude and my thanks to uh, those who have served in various capacities throughout, this, uh, throughout the church uh, over the past um, ministry year. As Lou mentioned, uh, we start a new ministry here uh, with this Sabbath, the first Sabbath in July. I think we're in July, aren't we? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there, there have been those of you who have borne the burden over the last year, and I just want to acknowledge that and give you thanks for that leadership, whether you're, whether you're tucked away in, in, a, in a cradle roll Sabbath school or whether you're teaching a Sabbath school lesson or whether you're behind the scenes in the kitchen or whether you're, you're helping us to praise the Lord with music or, uh, or, or in whatever capacity you might have served. Just know that it was for the Lord, and uh, you have blessed us, and we're grateful to that for, for that. And, um, and uh, yes, uh, someone I've worked most closely with is, of course, Gary. Uh, he's been stuck with me being the head elder for, since the, for the entire duration that I've been here, and now Lou takes over from him, uh, and we're grateful for, for that. And for those of you that have accepted the call for this new year, uh, it just... I'm grateful. I'm grateful because church doesn't happen and souls are not one for the kingdom because of uh, one key individual or because of uh, some celebrity or something like that. It's, it's it, loving a person happens in community and uh, you are that community. And so I'm grateful that you've chosen to let the Lord use you the way that he has over the past year and uh, that you put your hand up for the coming year as well. I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 3 this morning, Matthew chapter 3, and uh, I've entitled the message this morning, Ready to be Born, Ready to be Born, Matthew chapter 3. Uh, we're looking here from verse 13 to the end of the chapter and on into the next chapter. We'll jump to Luke chapter 4. We'll go, uh, go to a few locations and a few places this morning as we consider what does it look like to be ready to be born into the kingdom of God. You know, one of the most amazing miracles that I've ever had the privilege of seeing happen um, three times over in my own family is the birth of, uh, of children. To see from conception, tracking their development. You know, when a child is conceived, they are not ready for the big world yet, are they? They're, they're just a few little cells that grow and b bones begin to form and sinews begin to form and the miracle of life begins to happen. And, and if ever you wanted to be convinced of creation over the theory and the fallacy of evolution. Just, just study the concept of conception and birth and all the myriad of things that has to take place there in order for a life in its fullest form to be born nine months down the line. It's just an absolute miracle. Every time a child is born, we think that because it's somewhat naturalistic, it's not miraculous. You know, because it happens so regularly, it's not miraculous. But let me tell you, every healthy birth is a miracle. When you consider the vast array of things that could go wrong that prevent a healthy birth. And uh, as you track that child, you know, you go for those ultrasounds and you watch. You watch on that screen as you see first just a heartbeat. And then you see little appendages a few months later. And you, and you start to even be able to recognize facial features, uh, especially if you're getting these modern 3D scans. You know, it's just a miracle to see this child. But if that child is born before its time, it is in serious trouble, Yes. And if that child refuses to be born for whatever reason for, for, for too long a period, that child is in serious trouble, right? If you go too early or if you go too long, that child is going to be in distress and is at risk. And I want to suggest to you that there is an opportune time for each of us to be born into the kingdom of God. There are times in our lives when God brings us into a, a season of readiness, of preparedness, to, to go forward wisely, intelligently, with all of our heart, to become a part of the family of God, to be born into this new life experience. It's no wonder to me that Jesus chose the miracle of birth as a, as a metaphor to describe what it is like to come into the family of God, to be born into a new life and a new experience. And we see Jesus stepping into this experience here in Matthew chapter 3. And it reads as follows from verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? Now this makes perfect sense. John is the one who invents baptism. All right. Hence we call him John the 
the Baptist, right? He's the one that comes up with this new ceremony, this new form, this new way of celebrating, this, 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 this unique thing of starting a new life. And he's preaching typically to a bunch of sinners, right? He's preaching to people like him, and he's preaching to people who are in, a, in perhaps even a worse place than him because many of the scribes and the Pharisees were coming to be baptized by John. And some, some of those scribes and Pharisees admired by population, yet deep down inside they were found to be hypocritical sinners, right? Their religiosity on the outside was hiding or was a veneer for a, a corruption on the inside. And so John invents this thing that's designed to teach about the washing away of an old life, the end, the termination of living for self and living in hypocrisy and stepping into a newness and an authenticity of a life for God. And so Jesus comes along and he wants to be baptized by John. And for the first time in John's entire career, he's preaching to a man who is not a sinner, <laughs> And this is the man who responds and comes forward to be baptized. Can you understand John's dilemma? And John recognizes this is the wrong way around. <laughs> I am a sinner. And the one who the only, only truly righteous one wants to be baptized, this should be the other way around. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Now, I want to ask you this question. What does this mean? It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Well, why did Jesus say, we need to do this for righteousness to be full? Verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. Now that's interesting. Well pleased. Uh, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness is pleasing to God, isn't it? Isn't it? And there is a celebration that takes place as Jesus is baptized. A celebration not just of a human family welcoming a fellow mortal into the family, but you have this very marked celebration between the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of the few times you see them in one place simultaneously yet distinct from one another. The Holy Spirit visibly present. Jesus, the one who has been baptized. The Father speaking audibly from heaven, acknowledging Jesus as his son, acknowledging he pleases me. I am well pleased. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in fellowship with one another, involved in this event together, celebrating with one another. And Jesus fulfilling all righteousness. Now, I think there's at least two ways in which we can understand this. Number one, Number one, there is a prophecy that you will find in Daniel chapter 9. A prophecy of 70 weeks which announces the arrival of Messiah. And, and, the, and, the, and, and Messiah means the anointed one, right? The anointed one. That's what the, the title Messiah is. Someone who has been anointed. Anointing was an Old Testament practice where a prophet would show up like Samuel and would choose a king. And this is the one whom God had chosen. And it was, it was, it was demonstrated by a, by a flask of oil being poured over the head of that individual. The oil being a symbol of what? The Holy Spirit. A, a visible symbolic representation that this individual has been chosen and selected by the unseen God. But for, for, for people who are visual and physical, here is something that will show you physically what has happened invisibly. God has chosen this individual, set them, set them apart from the rest, is giving them a special measure of His Holy Spirit as He calls them to service, and that is visibly demonstrated by the anointing of oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, all pointing forward symbolically to the one, the ultimate one, the chosen one, the one above all others who was chosen to be prophet, priest, and king in one being, the Jesus Christ, our Savior, right? This one was chosen by God before the foundation of the world. As Revelation says, at the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. Why? Because they knew in advance that a plan of salvation was going to be needed. They knew that to go forward with the creation of this world and this planet, rebellion would arise and there was a plan waiting in the wings. Not an afterthought, but a foreordained plan that God would rescue His children. 
And this Jesus that you see being baptized here is the one who was called, set apart from the beginning to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to be the prophet, the messenger to the human race, the chief of all messengers. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 1, the first few verses. He is the one who would be our high priest. You'll find that in the book of Hebrews, right? Prophet, priest, and king of kings. And this is the moment where he is anointed and becomes Messiah, called from before he was born, but now accepting this being set aside, becoming the anointed one. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 and the 70 weeks told us exactly when that would happen. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, as Luke tells us, Jesus came to the Jordan to be baptized by John, 27 AD. He's 30 years of age, roughly speaking, and he steps forward to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Everything that the prophecy pointed forward to was being fulfilled in Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And this marked the beginning of his new calling. Everything in his human life up to this point has been preparation. Every moment in the carpenter's shop, learning faithfully and serving his family and his father, his mother, his brothers. Everything he's been doing in the community around him is preparation leading to this moment where he accepts the calling of God. He fulfills the righteousness pointed forward to by the prophet Daniel in, in, in Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. But there's more. There's more. In accordance with that, Jesus is doing something phenomenal here. We know from later on teachings about baptism, particularly we'll get to this passage in a little while in Romans chapter 6. What is baptism a symbol of? Death, right? Death and resurrection. You die to the old life. You are resurrected to a new life. What would Jesus possibly be dying to? What, what is it? I mean, Jesus is without sin. Why is Jesus being baptized here? To fulfill all righteousness? It's prophetic. There's the calling of God. Yes, but, but baptism is for sinners, right? And you know, someone's going to say, well, Jesus is our example. Jesus, the perfect life, including his baptism, substitutes for those who, for whatever reason, were not baptized biblically or could not be baptized biblically. Yes, all true. But I want to suggest something more profound. When Jesus stands upon the river Jordan that day, on the banks of that river, he faces the same choice that every sinner must make when they turn towards Christ. And that is, will he die to himself? Jesus is a man, and he's standing here in the prime of his manhood. He can be anything. He can go anywhere. He can do anything he wants. Will he submit to the prearranged plan made in heaven? See, as the pre-incarnate Son of God, as the pre-incarnate second person of the triune Godhead in heaven above, he stepped forward. He volunteered. He said, out of, out of, this, out of this unity of, of three co-eternal persons, I will volunteer myself to do the hard yards. I will be the one that goes forward to meet humanity in human flesh. I will be the one, I will be the one who lays down my life, takes the suffering, the sin, the guilt of humanity. He decides that in the courts of of heaven, but he decides that as God. He must decide as man. And what is happening here on the banks of the Jordan is a moment of decision, a moment of choice as man, living as man, with all the opportunities of man and all the temptations of humanity upon himself, with all the prospects before him, now as man, not as untouchable God, but as, but as man who could be tempted, as man who could fall and fail, as man who is subject to the same rules and the same experiences as you and I. This man, will this man step forward and accept the call to lay down his life. You see, when Jesus stands on that muddy Jordan, not the clean water we use when we baptize here, but that muddy, murky Jordan, it is so much more like the grave than our nice clean water. And as he stands there on the banks of the Jordan that day, he is looking forward in time, some three and a half years from this very moment, looking forward in time. He knows what lies ahead of him. 
He has the prophetic understanding. He knows what he's being called to. And in his humanity, he stands there and makes the choice, will I die? And you know Jesus is, not, Jesus is not having to answer that question metaphorically or symbolically or spiritually or just morally. Jesus is having to answer that question very literally. If I, if I go ahead with this plan, it is a plan of certain death. Not the possibility of persecution, not the possibility of martyrdom, the absolute certainty to go ahead with what I agreed to in my divinity way back in the courts of heaven above, to go forward with that plan now in my humanity is the guarantee and the certainty of death. What will you choose, Jesus? What will you accept is the calling of your life, the purpose for your existence? What will you do with the burden that God has laid upon your heart? Will you submit or will you press forward to preserve your life, to save yourself, to abandon those in need, to live for your glory, for your honor, to live for your enjoyment, your pleasure, your power? What will you do, Jesus? What will you do? When Jesus steps forward and he goes down into that murky water of the Jordan, he has very consciously upon his mind that this is the commitment to a sacrificial death. This is the commitment to love his creation with the ultimate price, to love to the point where you can love no more, to the point where not even God himself can love any more, to the point where you have nothing left, not even your life. Jesus is making a very profound choice. And I want to suggest to you, it is a profound relational choice. It was not just a choice of morality. It was not just a choice of mission. It is all of that. It's never less than that, but it is more than that. Jesus is making a profound choice for family, a profound choice for relationship with his creation, no matter what the cost. Jesus is committing in his baptism to enter into community, even when it sucks you dry and leaves you dead. Jesus is being baptized into his own death that you and I might have a life. He accepts the call to live relationally, to, re to live in community with his creation and with his people. And to celebrate that, you have the triune Godhead making themselves visible and auditory. You know, they're, they're seen and they're heard. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The one, the one whom I have shared eternal communion with since before the first thing was created. This one who is just committed to have the communion between the, the three co-eternal persons of the triune Godhead shattered to establish community with humanity. Because that's what it would take in order for us to have community, in order for us to have relationship with one another, in order for us to be restored to relationship with God, the eternal, never broken community between the triune Godhead had to be shattered. Father, Son, Holy Spirit split apart. That's what happens at the cross. That's the severity of the judgment of God at the cross. Jesus dies that eternal separation, that idea of the second death that Revelation speaks about, that, that idea of the schism taking place between humanity and divinity. That's what he takes into his being. And the father steps forward and says, this is what it's about. This is why I'm proud of him. This is why he will be king of kings and lord of lords. This is why I chose him as my prophet, as my spokesman. This is why he is fitting, fitted to be your priest. Because he chooses to live in solidarity with you, even although it will cost him. Not just his death, but a separation in the Godhead. That's what your salvation cost. 
That's what it cost to establish this thing that we call church. That's what the church is built on. The one sure foundation of the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is the example you and I are called to when we receive the ordinance of baptism. Before you are ready to be born, you must be ready to die. Before you are ready to be born, you must be ready to lay aside your agendas, your mission, your vision for life, and you are ready to submit to the mission and the calling of God Almighty. And what is that calling? It is to live in community and loving sacrifice for other sinners, the undeserving. You and I are called to lay down our lives for one another, for God himself. I'd be willing to bet that when you were preparing for baptism, no one shared this with you. We talk about a lot of things when we talk about being ready to be born, when we talk about being ready to be baptized into the kingdom of God. I have seldom, if ever, heard anyone highlight that to be born into the kingdom of God is fundamentally to be joined to the family of God in a self-sacrificing, self-forgetful way, and you are not ready to be born, to come out into the spiritual kingdom until you are ready to die to yourself. The conflicts and the challenges of church life, living in community with one another, are born out of the fact that there is still too much of each one of us living in this community. And, and, and the bit of me that's still alive and the bit of you that's still alive, we bump up against each other. We don't want to serve or to sacrifice. We want to be served. It's about us, our rights, our entertainment, our fun, our enjoyment. And you are not serving me in obtaining these things which are fundamentally carnal. Because that is not what the kingdom of God is about. It's not about my enjoyment. It's not about my pleasure, my power, my prestige, my position. It's not about what I can get from you. It's not about being served. It's about me losing myself in love for God and service to humanity. That is when you are ready to be born. I want you to jump with me to the book of Acts chapter 2 where we, where we see this still more. We see this still more fully expressed, not just in the, uh, in the experience of Jesus, but here in his disciples and in the establishment of the early church. Jump down to Acts chapter 2 and we're looking here from verse 40. It says the following. With many other words, Peter testified and exhorted them. This is, this, is the, this is the day of Pentecost, right? The mighty sermon that Peter preaches, a call to decision. And he said, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Notice this. They, they, they were not just baptized into a, a nebulous Jesus Christ. They were not just baptized into God, as it were. They were not just baptized into, into knowing Jesus and being committed to a personal one-on-one -on -one journey with him. They were baptized in the name of Jesus and joined to the church. They were called into community and into fellowship. And if you think, if you think how do you you know that it was that personal, Adrian? How do you know that when it, when, it, when, it, when it says that they were added to them that day, it didn't just mean that they, that they now carried the name of the church and they all dispersed and went their own way and did their own thing. Well, carry on reading. Verse 42, they continued steadfastly. That is with, with, with what, what does it mean to be steadfast? It means to be predictable, right? It means, it means consistently. It means on an ongoing basis. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And what's that other word? Fellowship, right? In the breaking of bread and in prayers. And when you pray for someone, you have to know someone. That is, if you're going to pray for anything more than the mundane and the superficial, to know someone well enough to pray for them. They, they, they came together. They shared prayer together. They shared food together. They shared fellowship together. They shared doctrine and the word together. This was the picture of the early New Testament church. They were joined to one another as solidly as they were joined to Christ. And this is why the Apostle Paul comes along in other places and he describes the church as a body. Now he's talking in terms of service. 
He's talking about spiritual gifts, gifts or special abilities that, that, that God gives sometimes very miraculously for what purpose? That you may have the equipment to, sh- to, to serve me and I have the equipment to serve you. And together we serve one another and we serve our broader community. And, and, and Paul says it's like a body. Every little piece has its part to do. And the body is not healthy as long as the most obscure of parts is not in its place doing its thing. He says the body is like being connected to Christ. And the metaphor that he's, he's, he's drawing on is obviously if you decapitate the body, how much body do you have left? Nothing, right? You have no life in the body if it's decapitated, if the head is gone. That is the command center. Jesus Christ is the command center, the nerve center. He says, he says now here's the thing. The rest of us, the rest of us are those body parts. And the moment you disconnect yourself from another part of the body, it is the same as being decapitated, whether, whether you get cut off at the neck or whether the hand gets cut off at the wrist, it's dead. It cannot survive. It has life but for a few seconds or minutes before the cells are dead. And that's what it's like when we draw away from the body of Christ. When we think we can go it alone. When we get tired of the difficulty that sometimes exists, not all the time, but sometimes exists in the body of Christ. When we feel let down or we are outright betrayed or things don't go as they should in Christian community. And I begin to hold myself distant from. I might even still come to church, but I'm not really involved in the community. I'm not really knowing my brothers and my sisters intimately. I'm pretty much just showing up for a group experience, then living my Christianity by myself. You will die. That is like being cut off at the neck. The picture was that as they were baptized, Acts chapter 2, they were added to them, and they were added to them in all intimacy and in all true community. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them among all as anyone had need. There, there, was, this, there was this spirit of sacrifice in a day and age when it cost you everything to come to Christ. It, it might even cost you your life. The church took responsibility for those, not those who were lazy, not those who just thought this is a great place to sponge off of, but those who were making the ultimate sacrifice to follow Christ, the the love of the brethren was so strong that they felt guilty, if you like, while I continue to live in comfort, while a brother or a sister newly joined to Christ has lost everything. And they'd be like, even if I have to give up something here, I will sacrifice to love my brethren. What What a picture of community, right? This is the real deal right here. This is what baptism was a symbol of. This is what it was like to be ready to be born. To no longer live for this world, its things, its possessions. To no longer live for my status or my pleasure. But just to love God and to love people. To serve them. To serve them. To see see everything I have, everything that I own, everything that I am. As just an asset to bless somebody else. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And get this, amazing thing began to happen. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Just an amazing thing that took place. All they did was learn to love one another. And God took care of bringing those to the church whom he wanted them to love into community. Are you ready to be born? There are some of you here today who have not been baptized. There are some of you here today who have not been baptized biblically. By immersion, full covering of water. There are some of you here today who have been baptized. Praise the Lord and hallelujah. Do you see, do you hear the call to readiness to be born? Number one, 
Jesus commits to the mission and the calling of Jesus. You and I are ready to be born into the family of God when we are ready to live for God's agenda, for God's calling, to be a part of his mission, to serve others. Jesus committed to community, to laying down his life for community, for loving people. You are ready to be born when you are ready to love people, to to, to, to embark upon the journey, not the magic wand experience, but the journey of ever more self-forgetfulness, the idea that I lay my glory in the dust for his glory, my glory in the dust for your glory. You are ready to be born when you're ready to step into the world of difficult relationships and you're there to stick it out because that's what love does. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Love endures all things. Love forgives all things. Love doesn't quit when the going gets hard, when betrayal sets in or disappointment overwhelms me. Love continues. It endures. It lays its own quest for glory in the dust. You are ready to be born. You are ready to be born. Jump with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And here's that famous verse we were referencing earlier on. And I'm going to pick it up here in verse 3. He says, do you not know, Romans 6 verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now you know, you know that beautiful verse, 1 John 3 verse 4, that tells you what sin is, right? Sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that we have studied previously together how that that law, that Ten Commandment law of God is all about the preservation, the safeguarding, the establishing, the protecting of healthy relationships. Relationship with God, relationship with other people. The whole idea of the triune God and being created in the image of God is that you and I are created created in relationship. What sin has done is it's distorted that relationship hierarchy. God no longer holds number one place. He might not be completely off the throne or completely out of the picture, but he's just not ruling as supreme in my life. Does that make sense to you? And when he is not supreme, and I have given my allegiance, my love, my affection to something that isn't God, there is a whole new set of ethics that takes over my life. There is a whole new set of commandments that I begin to live according to. Does that make sense to you? And that means that I'm living by a law contrary to the law of God, the law of healthy relationships, the law of love for God and love for humanity. You are ready to be born. You are ready to be baptized into the family of God and into Christ when when you are ready to live for nothing other than God upon the throne, when you live to serve, to love, we've covered that, but when you live in harmony, obviously, inevitably, if you're living to love, you're living in harmony with his commandments. You see, when I am buried in those waters and I come up out of that watery grave, I have identified with Christ on the River Jordan. I have identified with Christ on the cross who is dead and buried but resurrected to something so new, something so vibrant, something so intimate with God. I now no longer live deliberately and willfully in violation of the law of God. Does this make sense to you? Paul is here speaking about the moral orientation of our life. We've spoken about the community relational orientation. We've spoken about the missiological, the mission orientation, the calling of God. Here he's talking about ready to be born when you are morally headed in the same direction as God. You choose to live by his code. Now, now, now let me pause here for a moment because so far this morning, I've set the bar really really, really high. So high that I stand before you condemned by the very thing I preach. Yes? 
And you might be feeling that sense of condemnation because when I look at my life, I realize that I too often live for my own selfish agendas. Whether it's in my family or whether it's in the church or whether it's in the community, I too often live for something other than the mission and the calling of God. I I too often live for my comfort down here, for building my little kingdom down here, my comforts in life. I find myself so often living in violation of healthy relationships, I find myself living by a different moral code. So let me be really clear about this. You're not ready to be born. You're not ready to be baptized once you are sinless. Is that clear? If sinlessness is your standard, then good luck until the day Jesus comes. That's not the ultimate standard. We're talking about an orientation. We're talking about a commitment to direction. Does that make sense to you? We're talking about the fact that I live every day in humility and in repentance. We're talking about the fact that that we're not waving magic wands. We're not claiming sinlessness. What we're claiming is a new heart. That the the dominion of sin, the helplessness of of being thrown into the sin experiment, that power has has been broken. There is still residual sin, and there's still a journey to overcome sin in my life. Why? Because God never forces anything on you that you haven't chosen for yourself, which means that every day as you get to know Him better, you will see reflected back at you the ugliness of your own character, which means that every day you are called to repentance. Every day is a day of dependence upon Jesus. You are ready to be born, when you understand the new direction, when you choose the new direction, when that is your aim, where that is your goal, and where you are going to depend on Jesus Christ at every step of the journey. Are you with me thus far? So while we stand collectively condemned by this high and ideal standard, I want you to know and keep foremost in your minds, there is grace that is sufficient For you and me as sinners, there is a grace that calls us to this high ideal and this standard. There is a grace that says, though you are fallen, I will do this in you. You are ready to be born when you are ready to throw yourself on the mercy of the only God who redeems you from yourself. I want you to jump with me. To a beautiful passage in Matthew chapter 28. You know it well. It's called the Gospel Commission. And here we come full circle. Full circle indeed. Matthew chapter 28. And we're here in verse 18. And it goes like this. Jesus came and spoke to them saying. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And I'm so grateful that Jesus begins this little passage with that statement because what he's about to ask his disciples and thus what he calls you and I to as those who build on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets in this final era of, of earth's history of the gospel message going to the world is exactly, it's the same mission. The mission to the church given to those disciples is the same as today and it is an impossible mission. If you're going to try to do it in your own strength. Are you you with me? So I'm so glad that Jesus begins with these words. He has returned to the Father. He has been pronounced acceptable. His sacrifice has been received by heaven as all sufficient. And thus he comes back to his disciples with the good news and says, Now here's the thing. What I'm about to ask you, I just want you to keep this uppermost in your mind. All authority, all authority has been given to me. It is my right. All authority is mine. So what I'm about to ask you to do makes no sense in your own strength. But it makes all the sense in heaven's strength. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Go therefore. That word connects his previous declaration with what he's about to ask, right? The therefore. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All nations. No territorial boundaries, no political boundaries, no, no, no military boundaries. I want you to go to every nation. And here's what I want you to do. I want, the, I want you to make them disciples. Now, you know what it is to be a disciple, right? 
To be a disciple is not just someone who knows and recalls, recounts and speaks the story. That, that verbal acknowledgement is not enough to be a disciple. A disciple is one who emulates the one that they look up to. They, they, they dress like him. They talk like him. They use his expressions. They, they, they orient themselves towards the things that he likes, that he loves, that he does. This is what it means to be a disciple. Literally, to put your feet in his footsteps, to walk as he walks, to go where he goes, to be driven by what drives him, to have his heart living out his mission, his calling, his relational orientation today in this broken world. That's what it means to be a disciple. Are you with me? I want you to go to every nation, Jesus says, and I want you to make them disciples. I want you to get down into their hearts. I want you to, to, to share, to preach, to model something that changes them on the inside. Because you are not a disciple unless there is something happening on the inside. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. There's that, there, there's that being born again thing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded. And remember, I am with you even to the end of the age. Notice how discipling, baptizing, and teaching are used in the same breath. That's why I don't rush people into baptism. Because I believe it's important that we disciple people into Christ. I think it's important that we, that we teach them to understand and to know and to observe all things that He has commanded. Uh, uh, yes, it is a lifelong journey. Yes, you will grow ever deeper in that and ever wider in your understanding of that. But it is important, Jesus says, to know me because doctrine rightly understood is a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. Doctrine is not separate from Jesus. You've got Jesus and following Jesus, and then you've got these nice teachings over here about how to live your life. No, 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 no. That is a, that is a counterfeit definition of doctrine. Doctrine is the revelation of God in relationship with human beings. To deny doctrine, to downplay it, to push it aside is in essence to say, I'm not that interested in knowing the fullness of who God is, what He stands for, what He represents, and how He lives and what His kingdom is about. Doctrine is all about rightly understanding. I know, I know that there are two extremes of misunderstanding. The first one I've highlighted. Let's just push this doctrine thing aside. All it does is cause dissension and fights among people. Let's push that aside and just talk about the loveliness of Jesus. That's one extreme that I believe is, is completely counterfeit to God's intentions. The other one is very similar to that. But while it separates doctrine from the person of Christ, it overemphasizes doctrine and it makes doctrine everything. To the point where as long as you have right teaching and right doctrine, we're almost not even living in relationship with Jesus Christ. As if the doctrine saves us. No. The doctrine reveals the one who saves us. Does that make sense to you? Doctrine is a most beautiful thing, not a condemning thing, not a judgmental thing. It is a beautiful thing when it is understood as emanating from the very person of who God is. When, when I study doctrine to know God, to, because I want to I wanna revel Him and I, I want to know who He is, I want to stand in certainty with Him, I want Jesus in all His fullness. And doctrine becomes a relational journey. Not a relative journey, a relational journey. Do you understand the difference? It's not relative like whatever goes for whoever, but it is relational. It's fundamentally connected with fellowship, relationship in the person of God. Every step I take in unpacking and discovering true doctrine. Yes, people shy away from it because they go, if I, if I discover that, my call for change. What, what, if it, what if it says I've been wrong all this time? What if, what, if I, what, if I have, what if I have egg on my face because I've taught others, I've taught others this, this other stuff, and now I come to the realization I was wrong? There are a lot of human things that swirl around in our heart that cause us to push doctrine aside. But I'm saying to you, what if you viewed it as a journey to know and love your God more fully? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Wouldn't you want to come out of any hindrance, of any darkness, of any, of any doctrinal aberration? Wouldn't you want to come out of that for the sake of knowing Him more fully, of understanding His mind, of receiving His heart, of being in saving communal relationship with Him? Forget about the stuff that stands in your way 
that causes you to, to be weary of the quest for truth and righteousness. And think of it in terms of getting to know the one you love more fully. Now, I said we'd come full circle because this passage has the triune Godhead in it again. Did you notice that? We're to baptize them in whose name? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, when you and I stand in the waters of baptism and we are about to be born, as it were. We have been born by the Spirit before that, by the way. Do you understand that, right? The new birth happens when you and Christ interact with one another and the Spirit of God takes hold of your heart. But you celebrate that birth through the waters of baptism. Are you with me so far? In fact, you shouldn't be baptized. You're not ready to be born through the water until you're born in the Spirit. That being born in the Spirit must come first. Being born through the, through the merits of Jesus Christ, that must precede baptism. Otherwise, baptism is an empty ritual that will avail you of nothing. Because there is no magic that we pour into that water. There is no magic wand we wave upon those who come out of the water. The magic, if you like, is the working of the Holy Spirit upon the human heart. And that happens before you go through the waters of baptism. You enter into salvation before you go through the waters of baptism. Are you with me? Because you are not saved by baptism. You are saved by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you. You celebrate that salvation. You celebrate that birth by going through the waters. Does this make sense? You do not, you do not get married so that you will love the person you marry. If you tried that, you know it's a disaster. You fell in love. You learned to love that person, and then you celebrated that with a wedding. Are you with me? Same idea. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead living in communion with, with one another since, since the beginning of the beginning and before that, uh, until the end of the end and beyond that, that the triune Godhead living in community with one another, in love, giving birth to all of creation, laying down their life for their creation in the person of Jesus. This, this Godhead, you and I are baptized in that name, recreated in the image of the communal God. Seeking relational intimacy with God and with humanity. You are ready to be born when you receive the calling and the missional orientation of the kingdom of God. You, you are ready to be born when you are willing to lay down your life to serve and to love others. Your, not your glory, but God's glory. You are ready to be born when morally you recognize the authority of God's uh, relationship-preserving Ten Commandment law and intend to live in harmony with that law in every particular way, growing to ever fuller lightness and brightness as life goes on. You are ready to be born. You are ready to be born when you are standing in the correct teaching and doctrine that is a revelation of the personal God, Jesus Christ. You are ready to be born. How do you know if you haven't been baptized yet that now is the right time? Because mission, you're focused. Morally, you are focused. Relationally, you are focused. And doctrinally and teaching-wise, you are focused towards the kingdom of God. If you are in that group this morning who, who, who can say yes to those and you have not yet been baptized, it is time to be born. If you were born, but you have lost your orientation in some area, then today you are called to repentance. I want you to see something here. The moment that Jesus Christ has been baptized... The Bible tells us something profound. The moment that Jesus Christ committed to all of what we have spoken about today and went into the waters and was buried, prefiguring his own crucifixion, his own death, his own burial, his own resurrection. The moment he did that, something remarkable happens. He receives the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness. 
Don't miss that. Because when you are baptized and you commit to this, you become an enemy of everything Satan stands for. Where does the Spirit lead Jesus straight into the wilderness? And what does he encounter in the wilderness? Forty days of fasting and communion with God, right? Don't miss that part. He didn't just encounter the devil in the wilderness. Forty days of communion, of intimacy, of connecting with God. And at the end of it, when he is physically his weakest, Satan comes forward to tempt him and to break him. And Jesus faces the three biggest temptations of his life. And I want you to notice that at the end of that story, which you'll find in Luke chapter 4, the Bible doesn't say that uh, after those three temptations, Satan left him alone. Luke 4 says, Satan departed from him until an opportune time. Jesus was never left alone once he accepted to walk with God. And I want to highlight that because when you become relationally, missiologically, morally, and doctrinally oriented towards the kingdom of God and towards the person of God, when you step out of this world and into the kingdom of God, I want you to understand that when you come up against hard times and you face severe temptations and things are not easy, I want you to understand that you are only following in the footsteps of the master. And it does not mean you have been abandoned. It does not mean you do not have the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, his next assignment after celebrating all of those good things in the presence of God and people, he was led into the wilderness to commune with God and face the full brunt of the tempting power of the enemy. And when you run through those three temptations, they are profoundly relational. What was the first temptation? To turn stones into bread. Logical, seems like a good idea. I've got the power, but what would it have meant? It would have meant that he was doing things on his own and not living in a relationally dependent state before his father. He was ready to do what seemed good, but he would do it on his own initiative, with his own power, independent of God. The first temptation was not just a temptation of appetite. It was the temptation to pride. To do things in his own time, in his own way. Good things, not sinful things. Good things just apart from God on his own agenda. Second temptation, and depending on whether you're reading Matthew or Luke, they have them in a different order, but the second temptation is he takes him up onto a temple and says, throw yourself off here. The Bible says, and he quotes scripture, and tempts Jesus to presumption. That is, to use and abuse relationship with people or with God. For your own purposes and for your own intents. To prove a point, to get what you want. To establish yourself. The third temptation. I've got a quicker, easier, less sacrificial way to give you what God has already promised to give you. Ever face temptations like that? Ah, you you want to be king of kings and lord of lords? I'll tell you what, these kingdoms are mine. In a moment, he sees all the glory of the kingdoms of earth. And he says, now, all you have to do, no cross, no pain, no suffering, just slip to your knees, just for a second, and I will give these to you, and you won't have to die. The temptation to betray the single most important relationship between Jesus and his Father. I want you to understand that when you are born into the kingdom of God, you are born into the midst of a raging controversy. You are born into the midst of a war zone. Now listen to me carefully. The choice not to be born doesn't mean you're not in the war zone. It doesn't mean you get to avoid the conflict. But when you, when you make the choice and you defect... And you go over to the other side, the side of of God and Jesus Christ. When you do that, there is one thing that is hated more than the civilian population in war, the civilian population on the other side. There is one thing that's hated more than even the army on the other side. The one thing that is hated more is the spy or the defector. Does that make sense to you? 
Those are the ones who bear the brunt of it. You and I, when we choose Jesus Christ, when we go over, when you are born into this new life, you have defected from Satan's kingdom and you are hated with a passion. I want you to know this. You are also loved by a God who laid down his life for you. You are hated with a passion. And you are loved with a passion far more passionate than the hate that you're, that, that you're hated with. I want you to know and I want you to go into this with your eyes open. I want you to be able to, to say, I choose this not because of some fairy tale promises. I go into this choosing, knowing what I'm getting into. And I choose to trust myself to the God who has loved me to the point of death. To depend upon him day by day, I choose to give myself to the one who gave himself for me without any reserve. I choose to live for the one who died for me. You are ready to be born again into the kingdom of God when you're oriented with all your heart, with all your mind towards the God who lays down his life for you. If you are in that place today, do not delay the choice. Speak to me. Speak to one of our elders. If you are in that place today, do not delay because any child who goes beyond full term is in danger of a stillbirth. Do not delay if the voice of God speaks to you and you know that the time is right because the Spirit of God has done a work upon your heart that has oriented you towards the kingdom of God in every way we've described this morning, then it is time to be born into the kingdom of God. Amen.
Father in heaven, you've blessed us with life and with life eternal. You have blessed us with renewal internally, renewal externally, the way we live, the choices we make, and everything about us. You have blessed us, Lord, and you have called us to a lifelong and an internal journey with you and in your presence. Forgive us, Lord, where we have failed in this in any way. Forgive us, Jesus, where we continue to allow sin to rule. In those moments where we become unconscious of your presence, we forget what we are called to, we forget the, the truth that we stand in, we forget the people we're called to love, where we forget, Lord, to stand morally in solidarity with you. In those moments of life, Jesus, would you give us the spirit in an ever stronger and more real way? Would you interrupt the natural habits of a lifetime, the thought pathways that just fire off without even, without even conscious permission? Would you interrupt those things and call us back to moment by moment surrender to you? And if there's anyone here today who needs to make the choice, whose time is now, to be born, to be born again into Christ and into his family. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would move upon them strongly and mightily and that they would, that they would make that choice and establish that journey with you. Bless us through the rest of this day and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.